Well, hello everyone and welcome to Antarctica Deep Dive. I am Ashlyn Cousteau. I'm a journalist, an explorer, and a champion for Antarctica 2020. Now we really appreciate you all spending time to be a part of what hopefully is going to be a great discussion. But before we head down to Antarctica, uh, there are some short housekeeping rules that I wanna tell you. You can also find these in the Zoom chat box. So we suggest that people switch to gallery view so you can see all the speakers at the same time. Um, this session is being recorded. Now only the panelists have their videos on and the rest of you are muted with your video off. The session is an hour and will be divided in first a panel discussion, and then we're gonna open up the floor for Q&A with you all. Uh, you can either ask your question in the chat section as we are talking, or, um, and we can come to you once, once Q&A starts, uh, or if you wanna take the floor, raise your hand and one of our team will prompt you to speak. It's up to you if you wanna put your video on. So first, I would, like to briefly introduce the incredible panelists we have with us. So Jose Maria Figueras is the former president of Costa Rica and Antarctica 2020 founder. Ambassador Peter Thompson is the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy for the Ocean. Stephanie Langrock is the Camelar Commissioner for the Government of Belgium. Dr. Cassandra Brooks is joining us from the University of Colorado at Boulder. And Andrea Cavanaugh is the director of Pew Charitable Trust's Southern Ocean Campaign. But before we start the discussion, we would like to take you all down to the glorious and beautiful white continent of Antarctica to experience the wonders and the beauties and get us all in the mood for the discussion ahead. Encircling the icy continent of Antarctica, is the most pristine of all marine habitats. The Great Southern Ocean. Looking down on this ocean, the sheer beauty and power of the natural world is overwhelming. This is our last ocean frontier. Over 9,000 species that can't be found anywhere else in the world call this place home. Even species that don't live here depend on it. Strong Antarctic currents carry deep sea nutrients to faraway oceans, sustaining three quarters of the world's marine life. As remote as it is, the Southern Ocean is under increasing pressure. It's one of the fastest warming places on Earth. And there is a growing interest in commercial fishing in this area. The strain is becoming visible. We have the power to protect this ocean. It can be done, and in fact, it's already begun. In 2016, 24 countries and the European Union made history by creating the largest marine protected area on the planet in the Ross Sea. These countries are members of the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, or CAMELAR. Their visionary decision to protect the Ross Sea was praised around the globe. But CAMELAR also made an even more important promise, one that will have a bigger impact. They agreed to establish a network of large-scale marine protected areas throughout the Southern Ocean, including in the Weddell Sea, East Antarctica, and the Antarctic Peninsula. These protected areas would connect ecosystems, supporting marine animals that migrate between them as they forage and breed. And the benefits of these reserves will spread well beyond their boundaries. Our planet is changing. And never has this region been more fragile 
more important than it is today. Protecting the Ross Sea was only the beginning. It's time for Camelar to deliver on its word by working steadily toward a network of marine reserves that will safeguard the world's final ocean frontier before it's too late. As you can see, Antarctica is just such a beautiful, fabulous, important place. Um, and I wanted to start with first with Jose Maria Figueres. You know, what is Antarctica 2020 and, and why did you establish it? What do you aim to achieve with it? So Ashlyn, as you was saying, uh, Antarctica is this most beautiful, pristine place in the world. I've had uh, two times now the opportunity to be down there and there is just nothing like it. Um, and so Antarctica 2020 is a group of global citizens and we thank you for coming on board, representing many sectors of society, all of us concerned with the present state of the ocean's health. We need a rescue package for the global ocean, friends, a rescue package that will take it from decline to recovery. And there is no better place to start that rescue package than in the sea or in the ocean surrounding Antarctica by declaring marine protected areas that would not only help the ocean's health, but also build resiliency vis-a-vis -vis climate change for the continent of Antarctica. So, in the past, and under Kamlar's waters, Kamlar, as we have seen in the film, is the organization of 25 nations that governs Antarctica. Uh, we have been able to declare two important marine protected areas. One is in Domain 8, you can see it, the Ross Sea uh, Region MPA. And the other one is up to the uh, left-hand side corner, the South Orkney Island, South uh, MPA. Those two are about 1.5 million square kilometers. Um, and now we have the opportunity in this year's Kamlar session, which will hopefully take place virtually around the month of October, November, to declare three additional marine protected areas that would interconnect uh, very important habitats, uh, habitats around the continent, which are the East Antarctic, uh, Marine Protected Area Proposal, which is being proposed by France and the European Union. The Weddell Sea Protected Area Proposal, which is uh, proposed by Germany and the European Union. Um, and the Antarctic Peninsula MPA, proposed by both Chile and Argentina. Those three, which are ready to be approved, are the equivalent of 4 million square kilometers. That is full 1% of the ocean's size. And it would go a long way in terms of not only protecting these habitats, but also in terms of reaching our objective for 2020, which was to protect 10% of the ocean by this year, leading up to 30% by 2030. So scientists tell us the most important thing we can do to restore the health's ocean is to declare marine protected areas. And this would go a long way in that direction. Ashland, I think you are mute. Uh, and I just wanted to apologize for the for the sound issue earlier. So sorry for the sound issue earlier, everyone. Uh, we just posted in the chat room the link uh, to the video with sound, um, and it truly is is a fabulous video narrated by uh, by John Kerry. Now, Ambassador Thompson, I want to I want to move to you. Um, you know, we find ourselves in the midst of a global crisis, 
And there has been a lot of discussion regarding the leaks between the environmental crisis and COVID, the COVID crisis. Do you think that this crisis is gonna have an impact on our ability to achieve the SDGs, in particular SDG 14, all around our oceans? And is this crisis a hindrance or an opportunity for the Southern Ocean? Oh, Peter, you're on, you are on mute. Okay, can you there hear you me? There you go, Fantastic. yes. Okay, well look, uh, first of all, um, all courtesy is observed. Um, I, I did watch that video earlier and I encourage viewers to uh, look at it because it's so much more glorious with the sound and John Kerry's voice and really well put together, whoever did that. So greetings to everybody who's out there uh, with us in uh, cyberspace. Uh, and I hope that whatever your circumstances are, that you and your families are well uh, and safe at this weird time that we're living through. Uh, but let me answer your question by repeating something that I said at the opening of the Virtual Ocean Dialogues yesterday, uh, which is that we all know that governments and corporations are facing very difficult decisions at this time. Uh, of planning and managing the economic recovery from the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, and in the same breath, we have to face the fact that prolonged global economic slowdown runs an associated risk of reducing commitment to climate action, you know, which is not great news for Antarctica, of course. But such reduction just cannot be allowed to happen. And uh, surely by now, everybody knows the existential reasons why that is so without a net zero carbon world by 2050, we'll be placing future generations of humanity in great jeopardy. So in this pandemic world, um, it's, it's tough for decision makers and, and breadwinners to think long-term when the short-term exigencies of crisis and supply management are the priorities. But this is the time when decisions on massive financial commitments are in train before the seal is set upon them, we have to ensure the consequences of taking a low road back to the global warming, fossil fuel dependent, plastic polluting world that we knew are understood and avoided. So in the name of our children, we have to urge governments at this time, development banks, the agencies, the corporations, to think about long-term responsibilities and invest now in clean, blue-green infrastructure for a better future for us all. This is the time for our voices to be heard. Let me turn to the Southern Ocean. And first up, I'd like to tip my hat in Kamla's direction for agreeing back in 2009 that a network of MPAs should be established throughout the Southern Ocean. Kamla got the implementation of that process underway in 2016 with the declaration of the Ross Sea MPA. And that was great work, which some of you were involved in. As I'm sure you know, and uh, as uh, President Figueres has just outlined for us all, there are currently three more proposals for Southern Ocean MPAs on the table at Kamla. And you heard what they are, but I'll repeat them for, so we've got them clearly in our mind. And uh, I, th I was trying to do the math there. I think they represent about 3.8 million square kilometers of the ocean surface, uh, which, you know, that's, those are impressive numbers. And I believe if you combine them with what's being done around the world from big countries and small, that these three MPAs in Antarctica could be enough to get us across the 10% line of SDG 14.5, you know, conservation of marine areas by 2020, of course. And we need to remember that, that 14.5 is an internationally agreed goal that requires us to conserve 10% of marine areas before the end of this year. So those three MPAs that are on offer are the Weddell Sea, proposed by EU, Germany, and New Zealand, East Antarctic, proposed by EU, France, and Australia, and the Antarctic Peninsula, proposed by Argentina and Chile. What a wonderful gift it would be to a troubled world if Kamlo were to agree to institute these three Southern Ocean MPAs at its annual meeting in October, November this year. Through the hard lessons of the COVID-19 pandemic, we've all come to see that our best interests lie in a cleaner, greener world. Thus, as we struggle out of the grip of this pandemic, the declaration by Kamla of three great new protected areas of the Southern Ocean would surely solve the human conscience. 
and bring fresh hope to our quest for a better relationship with the natural environment of this planet. Can I also, in closing, just emphasize that 2020 is the 200th anniversary of the discovery of the Antarctic by the Russian expedition led by Bellinghausen and Lazarev. And I can think of no more fitting recognition or celebration of this seminal moment in global history than the declaration this year of three of the three proposed Southern Ocean MPAs. And so a wonderful opportunity lies before CAMLA this year to bring together discovery and science, ecology, and the very best of human endeavor. So let us all do whatever we can to assist a happy arrival at such consensus by October. Thanks for the opportunity. Ambassador, thank you so much. And so, <clears throat> so well said of just how important uh, for the globe and for uh, humankind the Southern Ocean is. But uh, Cassandra, um, Cassandra Brooks, I, I would like to ask you, you know, as a scientist, why, why is Southern Ocean important to humankind? Why, you know, it's so, people feel that it's so far away. It is at the bottom of our planet and very few people ever get to go there. Why should, why should we care? Great, thank you for that question. So actually, before the 1700s, no one even knew Antarctica existed. Maps from early explorers would show only emptiness in the south. However, the ancient Greeks actually insisted that this great southern land must exist in symmetry with the north. Without it, they said the whole world would topple over. And I absolutely love that metaphor because the Greeks were right. And since its discovery, scientists have documented that the Antarctic stores the majority of the world's freshwater, it regulates our climate, it drives global ocean circulation, and despite its harsh conditions, it is the coldest, iciest, windiest place on Earth. Antarctic waters teem with life, as you saw in the video, they literally do. And in fact, some of our healthiest and most intact marine ecosystems left in the world are here in the Southern Ocean. But the thriving seascape is absolutely suffering. Our current climate crisis threatens to unravel the Southern Ocean's intricate ecosystem. And if I can, I want to share with you a story from my most recent trip to Antarctica this last December. Evidence of our environmental crisis was all around me. I was in the Antarctic Peninsula, one of the fastest changing regions on the planet. And we hear it on the news every day, at least the news I listen to, that another piece of an ice shelf, this time the size of Manhattan, is breaking off into the Southern Ocean. But being there in the height of the Antarctic summer, I could literally feel the ice breathing, hear its thunderous cracking, and literally see it melting. And in the 15 years that I've been going to Antarctica, I've witnessed dramatic changes. Regions of the peninsula in particular have experienced significant warming. The warming is causing almost 90% of glaciers in the region to retreat. Ice shelves are collapsing, reductions in sea ice, and unpredictable shifts in the marine ecosystems as species literally are struggling to adapt. And perhaps most unsettling to me anyways, as I named my two children after Antarctic wildlife, was to see how Adelie penguins, my daughter's namesake, had almost completely disappeared from the region. These penguins depend on colder temperatures and thus have moved south with other penguin species taking over their nests in some places. And let me elaborate further the significance of this shift. Adelie penguins nest on the few small patches of ice-free rocky land throughout Antarctica, and they build nests using pebbles. And pebbles are very precious in Antarctica because it's such an icy place. And they actually spend tremendous energy gathering pebbles, stealing them from each other, and building nests um, out of these pebbles. And every nesting season, the Adelies come back to the nest, which they built the season before. And this ritual has been carried out for thousands of years in some colonies. So to witness the abandonment of some breeding sites in a matter of years is a dramatic change to say the least. Adeli penguins are moving south, but as the south warms, as you can imagine, they'll have nowhere else to go. And so for me, I'm thinking about my daughter Adeli's lifetime, that she may actually see the disappearance or at least the drastic reduction of the species that is her namesake. And to point out too that as animals in the region are struggling to adapt, they're also facing increasing pressure from industrial commercial fisheries. And many people are surprised that we're fishing all the way down in Antarctica. And really the only reason that we are, that we're sending vessels into the most treacherous remote waters in the world with fishers literally risking life and limb is because our fisheries closest to home are overexploited. Collapsing fish populations across the world have forced vessels into more deeper and more remote waters. And in Antarctica, this is literally the most remote place on earth you can fish. The Ross Sea fishery actually for Antarctic toothfish is the most remote fishery in the world. So it really shows that we're at the edge of our resources fishing down here. 
And the first time I went to Antarctica was as a fishery scientist studying the life history of Antarctic toothfish. And toothfish are sold as the lucrative Chilean sea bass in upscale markets around the world. But toothfish are the top fish predator of the Southern Ocean. And this is an environment where we don't have sharks. Sharks aren't fit to live. And so toothfish, toothfish act as the sharks of the Antarctic. They grow in excess of two meters and 140 kilograms, and they're superbly adapted. They have antifreeze proteins in their blood to keep it from freezing, but they're a vulnerable deep dwelling fish, which matures late and lives to be 50 years old. We know this fishery will not be sustainable in the long term. We're not only exploiting the top fish predator, we're exploiting the key prey species, Antarctic krill. Krill form the basis of the Southern Ocean food chain and feed everything from whales to fish to seals and penguins, including Adelie penguins. Krill are harvested to be turned into omega-3 pills and also for fish meal to feed aquaculture and livestock. So to be clear, we're not solving food security issues with these fisheries. And fisheries for krill in particular are on the rise and vessels are increasingly encroaching upon penguin and whale foraging grounds, already stressing the system more. And so just to highlight, as we've already heard, there is a solution. We know that protected areas can safeguard biodiversity and can even give life the best chance of enduring climate change. In recent years, we've made progress, including as we've heard about when governments made history in adopting the world's largest marine protected area in the Ross Sea. But recent research that we published actually just in April showed that there are still critically important areas of the Antarctic left unprotected, including in the three regions that we've heard about, the Weddell Sea, the East Antarctic, and the peninsula. And the urgency of these threats and the need for protection is critical now more than ever before. All life is connected to and depends on the Southern Ocean, and so it really is our global responsibility to protect it for the future. You're 100 percent right, and uh, you know, I just wanted to po point out to people again that, uh, that like Cassandra said, you know, 90 percent of our fish stocks are either overfished or fished to capacity, and that's around the world. And also, you know, krill, the basis of the marine food web um, is, you know, it really is thrives down in Antarctica. And then the waters are pushed all over the world in this ocean conveyor belt. So it truly is the kind of the basis for all of our uh, marine life down there. And that's just how, how important this place that feels so far away and is physically so far away. It's really just in our backyards through our food system and our weather systems. So Andrea, I want to move, I want to move to you and I want to talk about solutions and I want to talk about specifically marine protected areas because we know they work. We know that when we establish a marine protected area, it gives the ocean a break. It gives it a chance to litter, to breathe for the fish to come back uh, because fish know no boundaries, right? The fish swim wherever they want. Um, but why are MPAs specifically so important down in the Southern Ocean? Thank you so much, Ashlyn. It's a pleasure to be here and, and, and to be here with this whole esteemed panel. And, you know, as you just said, and as we saw in the video, there's so much life in the Southern Ocean. It's so important to protect, but, you know, even more important is its role in the global regulation of climate and, and distribution of nutrients around the world to feed world fisheries. And it's just so important to protect this place and, and how we can do that are marine protected areas, as you said. And study after study continues to show that one of the best ways to protect the ocean is through um, areas where there is no fishing and no industrial activity allowed because these areas convey numerous benefits even to outside of the actual protected areas. And these benefits include conserving biodiversity, like the 9,000 unique species that call the Southern Ocean home, um, and eliminating stress like fishing, which helps ecosystems and species, as you said, build resilience in the face of a changing climate. Um, adding and expanding protected areas in the Southern Ocean would ensure also that these relatively undisturbed waters remain a natural laboratory so that scientists can actually study how intact marine ecosystems react to a warming and acidifying ocean. That's incredibly important. There are very few places like this left on the globe where there are intact, fully functioning ecosystems that scientists can look to to find out how they are performing as the earth continues to warm. Um, and the Southern Ocean has some of the most pristine and, and, and intact ecosystems left. So to ensure a thriving future for species, um, marine scientists have definitely recommended the creation of more marine reserves, something that as Peter said, and Jose Maria said, that 
Camelar has agreed to do and in fact could do this October when it meets. You know, 2020 was billed as the year of nature. That seems so long ago. Um, but in some respects, it's proving to be exactly that as nature teaches us that we need to get serious about how we exist on this unique planet. Many of the meetings and events um, to push ocean protection forward were postponed to 2021, but the need to act is there and more urgent than ever. And CAMELAR is one of the opportunities that is still scheduled to happen and can make large scale Southern Ocean protection to be a few of the remaining op opportunities left for conservation progress in 2020. I mean, this seems like a win-win for everyone. So what, what, what has been blocking the, the, the progress of these MPAs? What are, what are kind of the politics behind the scene and, and how can people help? So I think um, it was interesting and important to hear what Peter had to say that, um, you know, 200 years ago, Russian explorers discovered the icy continent. And since then, it's served as this beacon of peaceful and scientific international cooperations and governments have been working together to create this network. But so the commission itself, though, is compo composed of 25 different member states and the European Union. And some of these members have strong commercial fishing interests in the Southern Ocean, but all decisions that Camelar makes must be done by consensus, which means every single member has to agree to protect an area. Um, and consensus can move slowly. Countries have to get there on their own speed. Uh, but Camelar, as we said, have, has shown that large scale ocean conservation is completely possible. It's, in fact, we made history in 2016 when Camelar adopted the Ross Sea, the world's largest MPA at 2 million square kilometers. And this feat just can't be understated. It was the culmination of hundreds of scientists and policymakers, thousands of conservationists and millions of global citizens over the course of more than a decade. But ultimately it just came down to the political will of those Camelar members to join in consensus. And I have to tell you in that moment when consensus came, it's just, Hard for me to even describe how incredible it was. The room exploded in applause. Nations were hugging each other. Um, everyone knew that they had just done something momentous. Stephanie is smiling because she knows because she was there and she remembers what an incredible um, time that was. And so, you know, what Camelar did in 2016 shows that despite the political tensions in other parts of the world, Antarctica continues to be a global commons dedicated to peace, science and conservation. Um, in fact, the very signing of the Antarctic Treaty which sets aside the continent or the land of Antarctica happened at the height of the Cold War in 1959. So prior to that, in the 1950s and 40s, countries had been dividing Antarctica up like a big pie, you know, staking all their claims uh, in the then the US and then Soviet Union actually had plans to launch rockets. Um, and, and countries, especially in the Southern Hemisphere, were really worried that Antarctica would be used as a launching pad for nuclear war. But incredibly, instead of waging war, crisis led to a breakthrough. And in 1959, they signed the Antarctic Treaty, which banned military activities and created a nuclear free space and suspended sovereignty. Um, and so what this drives home is that, you know, Antarctica is an exceptional space where collaboration is possible, no matter what the political climate is. But you know, it also reminds me and gives me hope that crisis can lead to breakthrough. And now in the midst of a climate and biodiversity crisis and a global health crisis, I'm, I'm hopeful that we will be able to achieve this historic act of conservation in the Antarctic this year. Well, I, I wanna move on to Stephanie, um, who was there during, as, as Andreas, you just said, as, was there during uh, the Ross Sea designation and, and celebrated and one thing that I think that we need to celebrate is that the EU is responsible for putting two of these MPA proposals up. Um, and I wanna read this quote because it's so amazing. In the recent European Commission's biodiversity strategy, it said, quote, the EU should also use all of its diplomatic leverage and outreach ca uh, capacities to help broker agreement on the designation of three vast marine protected areas in the Southern Ocean. You know, Stephanie, do you think we can get there? 
that's going to be my question for you. Do you do you think we can get there, and how can we help uh, Camlar get there? Hi, uh, thank you, and good afternoon, good evening, good morning for some of you. I think it's another honor for me to be here uh, and and share this discussion with you. Unfortunately, I was smiling with a bit of sadness because although I was Kemler commissioner in 2016, I was at another meeting and I had to hear all the excitement <laughs> from my colleagues representing me, <laughs> Belgium in, uh, in Hobart. So from a personal perspective, I'm really looking forward to experience such a moment. Uh, in the near future. So I really hope we can get there uh, soon. Um, as uh, Jose Maria and Peter have said uh, before, as Kamler, we agreed to establish a network of MPAs in 2012, uh, by 2012. And this was a sincere commitment towards the global community. And for me, as today is 2020 and we still haven't reached that representative network, it feels like kind of breaking a promise. And all of us can relate to that feeling, I guess. So I, I, I sincerely think it's time for action and all the EU member states and the European Commission and uh, are very much convinced of that. And Taking up uh, the MP or the Southern Ocean in uh, the European, the new European biodiversity strategy for me is a sign of that we mean that we are serious about this. It's uh, it, the, the European Commission and uh, President von der Leyen uh, are very committed to the European Green Deal and to uh, transforming uh, the Euro Euro Europe for a sustainable future. And that is not only for Europe, but that is for all of us, for, the, for everyone across the globe. Because as the current crisis has shown, everything is interconnected and we are all also connected to Antarctica. So we need to step up for a healthy world, a healthy ocean, a healthy population. And we have these three proposals of which two are support or proposed by the European Union and its member states and driven by uh, Germany and France who have been doing a tremendous work and also scientifically sound work. So the proposals are there, they are ready to be adopted. Um, and we have to find a way to touch to touch the hearts of uh, all the other members of Kamlar also. In the past, Kamlar has been a, a, um, an example of leadership and we have to get back to that leadership. And as part of multila multilateralism, which is very important for Kamlar, but also across the globe and for the Agenda 2013 and even more so for SDG 14, we need to, to um, we need to listen to each other and try to um, address the issues of other members mm -hmm. and hopefully mm -hmm. then we can get to an agreement. There's still, the proposals are there. If you ask the, the EU members, we consider them ready as they are, but we have to find an agreement with the other member states and there's still a lot of work on to do there and we need very high and strong or high level and strong engagement and commitment by all parties to reach that agreement as soon as possible. Um, I think I will leave it here. Um, <laughs> that was that was wonderful. And and then my, so my question is going to go back to Jose Maria and and to Peter. Jose Maria, we'll start with you. You know what what can people do? What what needs to be done to kind of get this across the finish line, uh, these three protected areas that will just really help give our Southern Ocean a break. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. So Ashland, um, we need to come out of this crisis for better, not into the same place, but we need to come out for better. And coming out for better means 
to cooperate, to believe in a multilateral world, to work together, to solve the challenges that we have as humanity, as one family living on this planet, which we should rebaptize ocean instead of earth. It's 70% of the surface. And 2020 was supposed to be the year of the ocean and can still be the year of the ocean. We were going to meet this year in St. Petersburg to talk about the Arctic and the Antarctic, then in the Monaco Blue Initiative to kind of carry forward the momentum. Then Peter was going to lead us in the UN Ocean Conference, where we were going to be this week in Portugal. Um, and then we were going to meet up in China for COP15, the Biodiversity COP in the fall. So I still believe that we can make this the big ocean year by moving ahead and taking advantage of these forums and of what we can do individually and collectively to get the ocean back on track to recover its health and get us up to 30 by 30, 30% 30 of the ocean protected by the year 2030. Of course, as Stephanie just mentioned, Kamlar needs to move by consensus, uh, and, and that is fantastic. Uh, but we need to help countries move towards consensus. And there are two countries which I believe could make a terrific gift to humanity that will be remembered forever and ever if they decided to push forward with its three MPAs this year in Kamlar. One is Russia. Peter mentioned 200th anniversary of the discovery of Antarctica by Bellinghausen. Uh, what a gift to humanity for Russia to come out, assume a position of global leadership and say, here, 4 million square kilometers, 1% of the total ocean surface declared as MPA. And the other country is China. We were going to China up for the COP on biodiversity with tremendous hopes and expectations that we would be able to begin to reverse the sixth massive extinction in which some scientists say we are. Sometimes they call it the Holocene uh, extinction or the Anthropocene extinction because of human activity. And that we would come out of China um, energized to move in that direction. And as has been said here by the panelists, all of the life around in Antarctica is in the ocean that surrounds it, not on the continent. Andreas shared with us here that 9,000 species call their home Antarctica. And to hear from Cassandra about the toothfish at the top of the food chain and the krill at the bottom, which are being fished for omega-3, which can be substituted with vegetable omega-3. My goodness, where are we going as humanity? So Russia, give us a birthday gift, 200 years. China, give us leadership in terms of returning to a safe and sound biodiversity. And the rest of the countries tag along with Russia and China. And all of us push all of them. We need to get this done. We need to get it over the hump. Come on, let's get out of this crisis for better, not into the same place. Yay! <laughs> I completely agree. And I think that, you know, you made a, an incredible point, a sad point, but, it, you know, we've lost 50% of the biodiversity on our planet in the last 40 years. I'm turning 40 at the end of this year. And I mean, that's just crazy to think that half of the living things on this planet are gone. Um, Peter, what do you think, what do you think that we can all do to help uh, achieve this wonderful, um, uh, these three MPAs and get, that would be 1% of our total ocean and it would get us so much closer to the, you know, 10% by the end of this year, by 2020 and 30% of our ocean by 2030. So Peter, what, what can we all do to help support these MPAs? 
Ashlyn, I'll, I'll answer your question, just, but just on one condition, which is that Cassandra will tell us the name of her second kid, because we know about Adderley, and we're all trying to think, you know, what? Uh, okay. Is it emperor? Is it a boy called emperor or something? Okay. Um, I'll leave that to Cassandra and you, of course, but... Um, Thanks for your question. Uh, look, how do we get there? You know, it's, it, how do we get anywhere in, in, in the world? It's groups of people getting together and doing the right thing. And I really w do want to take the opportunity of congratulating Antarctica 2020 for exactly that, getting together and trying to do the right thing for Antarctica. And, and I loved Andrea's comment about how 2020 is proving to be this great lesson you know, it's, it's, see this in a positive, which is that, you know, it's so much easier for us to talk now about the human relationship with the natural world. Before people looked at us like we we're a bunch of tree huggers, but you know, now tree hugging is actually a pretty nice thing to do if you can get outside and into a park. Uh, so, uh, you know, the point being that um, we have to take the positive out of it, as I think, I forget who it was, Churchill or somebody says, you know, never waste a good crisis. Uh, look, science is what this is all based upon. And I think, uh, you know, mention has been made of Russia and Russia's always insisted that, yeah, we can get there on these things, but we have to do the science properly. Uh, everything that I'm advised uh, in this area is that the science has now been done. It's, it's uh, countries of one by one come across the line. It's not just China and Russia, a bunch of others, uh, but they're one by one, they've come across the line and said, yeah, we're satisfied that, that we've done the necessary science now on these areas. So I think that's why there is this mood of optimism that we can get there this year because of that good science has been done. And I really want to thank the countries that have been pushing this along uh, and you know who you are. Um, there was some very uh, good points made by Stephanie and uh, the multilateralism line is something that we've all got to be pushing for uh, in these uh, strange times. Uh, the, um, you know, I won't go too much into that. Uh, I mean, uh, El Presidente has already mentioned for me the, uh, what's, uh, what we can do with China and Russia to work with them. Uh, to get there. I think those are both very valid points about Kunming and China's case. They've got real skin in the game to make sure that, uh, that, that this is a good year for nature because of their hosting of that CBD convention. And also, you know, the point that's been made now twice about Russia's uh, role in the discovery of Antarctica and the fact that we must celebrate this 200th anniversary. But I think the point that uh, I really wanted to emphasize, and somebody in the panel already said it, is about this connectivity, you know, that everything is connected. Uh, as you know, I come from Fiji. And, you know, our fish are leaving. They're going to the poles. Uh, in, in our case, uh, they're actually going across to South America as well. We're talking about tuna. We're talking about, you know, for a country like Tuvalu, where it gets over 90% of its foreign exchange from. The fish are leaving because of these changing oceanic conditions. Uh, and uh, so it's very serious stuff for us, this connectivity of everything. Uh, and if you, if, you, if you take that into the ocean, you can also take it into our human relations. You know, you're all connected in some way with somebody who can make a difference over the next few months in this lead up to Kamla. Um, the reason I don't have any hair is I pulled it all out over the last couple of years because every year Kamla failed to make another MPA. Uh, this cannot be that year, okay? We've got to get those three MPAs uh, through this year. So just use your connections. Um, I don't want to talk about what we're doing because some of the people sitting here in this panel are involved in that work that we're doing with governments at high level. But it doesn't all have to be at a high level. You know, you've got your scientific contacts. You've got your NGO contacts. Exercise those, uh, that connectivity that you have around the world. And uh, we'll get there in October. Thanks very much. Thank you, that's so great. Well, uh, we're gonna start the Q&A. Uh, and the first question is going to Cassandra from Peter. Uh, what is your uh, second child's name? So yeah, my husband and I have both worked in Antarctica a long time. So the, our first child is Caden Adeli. Caden means warrior, but she goes by Adeli. So she's our warrior Adeli. And then our son who was born uh, shortly after the Rossi MPA, came into force is named Orion for the constellation, but Ross for his middle name, for the Ross Sea or for Ross Seals. I mean, there's actually a lot of options 
with Ross there. So, and just to be clear, Adele is a real name. It, you know, it's the French version of Adele. So, <laughs> so is Ross. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Those are great names. I that I'm just incredible. Okay, so I'm gonna go to questions from uh, from our audience. Sorry, I have them on my phone. So, uh, okay, the first one is from Sophie Mirgo. Speaking of consensus, what lessons learned from Camlar um, can be given to the future high seas BBNJ agreement? I think I'm going to go to Andrea for that one. Sure, thanks, Ashlyn. And that's a fantastic question, Sophie. Um, so as I said, consensus is rough, right? Like trying to get every country on board at the same time is a really difficult decision. Um, I mean, a really difficult um, feat. But the thing about consensus is, is once everyone's on board, it's done and everyone's behind it and everyone is, is standing behind it. And, and that's one of the things I think that I took home as a lesson. I would often complain about consensus at Camelar and like, why do we have to get consensus? This is crazy. It takes so hard. It takes so long. But um, then we saw all these parks put into place and MPAs put into place where um, a new president or a new administration could come in and they could actually overturn that decision. And that doesn't happen when you have consensus, when you have all the countries behind it. So I, I think it's important to work towards consensus. I think that you should, you should try to get all those countries on board. I think under the ABNJ process, you maybe have uh, a few different alternatives to strict 100% total consensus. And maybe that's something you want to um, look at. Um, in those areas, but I do think that con there's nothing stronger than consensus when it comes to a decision like that because everyone is behind it. Jose Maria. Thank you, Ashlyn. I fully agree with Andrea on the importance of consensus, uh, but I also want us to understand that it cannot be a consensus built on the lowest common denominator because that is not the way to go here. And taking the positive spin that Peter mentioned, we have to put on everything from here on out, I would advise Sophie that we take advantage of the fact that we have more time in the BBNJ negotiations to become a lot more aspirational in what we want to achieve, to raise the bar with respect to BBNJ and not settle on the lowest common denominator because that is not going to carry the day. I mean, when we're talking about the high seas, which are 66% of the surface of the ocean out there, which are only fished by less than 15 nations that only can fish out there because of the subsidies that they receive from their governments, uh, and that that fishing is in detriment of the fishing done by 144 countries that have economic exclusivity zones and coastlines with thousands of hundreds of thousands of fishermen, depending on that, we need to be really aspirational and have a high bar when it comes to the BBNJ negotiations. So if we declared the high seas a marine protected area, we would have over a 500 fold increase of biodiversity for 144 nations and millions of peoples around the planet. That's the way to go, not the other way around. So yes, consensus, yes, at the highest level, let's be aspirational. Let's come out of this crisis for a better ocean and a safer planet. I love that. And it's true. We, uh, I mean, the ocean, the ocean connects us all. It does not divide us all. And I think that's a lesson that everyone uh, needs to always be thinking about. So Stephanie, what other lessons um, had, did you all learn with and another question for you? What other lessons did you all learn about the Rossi MPA and and how important is it to make sure that these MPAs, specifically in the Southern Ocean, aren't just MPAs on paper? That's a very good question. And it's very important also because we do not want paper parks. We really want marine protected areas. And for that, um, 
all of the members have been working together to set a, up a research monitoring plan for the Rossi MPA and uh, are doing research and, and uh, will do the monitoring if the measures that are um, that are provided in the in the in the marine protected area if they are doing what they have what they should do if uh, populations of species are are, are um, recovering uh, if biodiversity is uh, growing again if ecosystems are res restoring so it's a long-term work but it's a very important work so the the work only starts with the, uh, the adoption of the MPA so it's a very important goal we have now to adopt the other proposals but that's only the start of the work. The most important work will it has to follow afterwards to, to really ensure that uh, ecosystems and biodiversity are recovering uh, from all the human um, activities that have uh, taken place across the globe. Mm -hmm. It's just so true. Now, Peter, this one's coming to you. Um, one of this, this question, it's technically about sustainability um, sustainably financing protections on Antarctica, um, which would suggest that without fisheries, there isn't financing for MPAs. Um, I, the question says, I think that is sometimes, that, that sometimes countries do that regardless um, if the fisheries of Antarctica, uh, if they get protection now. Um, do you have any thoughts on that of, of maybe of monetizing these uh, fisheries to finance the MPAs? Uh, look, as you know, there is an element uh, of fisheries that comes out of the Ross Sea MPA. Uh, these are, uh, you know, managed. Um, so that's a that's a good possibility. I always say with marine protected areas, and you know, obviously, I'm a huge fan of them. I do think that uh, we have to move to that 30% by 2030, uh, and I and I and I'm hope that uh, people will see the wisdom in moving to 50% of the ocean at least by uh, at least by 2050. Uh, so yeah, we've got to do that. There, there are so many alternatives for us to get nutrition from the sea. We don't need to be chasing fin fish. This, this is the last. Uh, form of life that mankind still hunts for food, you know, fish. We don't need to do that. We've got sustainable aquaculture. We've even got, uh, you know, cellular fisheries we can move to, like uh, cellular beef on land. So th they're, the, they're going to be these alternatives. And in the meantime, for our own interests, for our own health, we've got to uh, have these uh, MPAs to protect the biodiversity, which is our survival on this planet. So costs. It's uh, about finance. You know, I always say, let's say you go to a, a small island developing country with a massive uh, MPA in either being declared or, or, or already in place. You can't expect that the taxpayers of that country, tiny as their tax base is, to govern and uh, protect the massive parts of the ocean, right? They just don't, they don't have enough money to pay for the fuel to go on a boat to make an annual trip around that, that EEZ and see what's it. So we're all in this together, right? Yes, we need them to make the declaration because they're their EEZs, but we've got to be doing this in partnership. We need the people with the satellites to be providing the surveillance. We need the people that have got uh, navies that are out at sea to be going out there and enforcing, and we should not be expecting little countries to do this on their own. So, I mean, the, the same kind of partnership applies to uh, Antarctica. You know, we've got to see us as, as this is being something that we're all in together. And uh, that consensus that we're talking about achieving at Kamla, you know, part of it, the discussion should be about the governance aspect. That's great. So speaking of that fishing and illegal fishing, um, Andrea, I think I'm gonna come to you. Um, you know, within b both fishing illegal fishing in the Southern uh, Ocean, both within and outside of the MPAs. What is Camlar doing to address this? And related, somebody else asked uh, and said that they heard that China is proposing to relax the role of observers. Uh, do you know anything about that? 
Well, let me take the last one first, Ashlyn. Um, I think one of the unfortunate things that's come out of, I mean, one of many unfortunate things that's come out of the global health crisis that we find ourselves in is that um, some countries are trying to relax lots of different fisheries regulations, uh, conservation ones that try to protect the fishery and that are there for a very good reason. Um, and I certainly wouldn't single, single out China as being the only country that is trying to do that. Um, you know, sometimes I think the, uh, the reasons are, are, are very clear that, and necessary because either an observer or an international observer cannot get to a boat, it can't get from point A to B right now. Um, but there are other solutions that we could come up with. We could, there's lots of ways to do electronic monitoring, video monitoring. Um, you could have your own observers backed up with, um, with uh, like I said, the electronic monitoring. So um, we have heard that it's happening in many fisheries and, and many countries are asking for those kinds of relaxation of those rules, um, which is unfortunate. Um, so then going to back to illegal fishing, um, I've actually worked on Antarctic issues since um, the early 2000s, and it was then that the toothfish fishery, the illegal fishing for toothfish, or what we call Chilean sea bass here in the U.S., was rampant, out of control. Um, it, there were boats just going down there and plundering, and there was nothing to, that, that Camelot was trying very hard to do to fix it. In fact, um, some of the fishers out of Australia were just at like livid that there were all these illegal fishermen down there and taking catch and they were trying to do their best to work with Camelar and work through other systems in CITES even to try to get them involved to regulate toothfish. But in the end, um, one of the things that we, I worked on was a, a campaign to get fat fish uh, chefs to stop serving sea bass, take a pass on Chilean sea bass and um, it, caused many chefs in the U.S. to stop serving the fish. And then the U.S. government had been trying for years to get better catch, get better um, catch monitoring regulations like electronic catch document schemes and um, centralized VMS. And they were able to go to Camelar and say, we have all this um, these questions about the illegal fish coming into the U.S. market. We are not allowed to sell illegal fish in the U.S under uh, Magnuson Stevens. So they, um, they said, if you wanna put your fish in the US market, you have to abide by these rules, electronic catch document, centralized VMS. So that cut down on the problem in a huge way. And that's not to say that it's not still happening because there are still illegal fishers out there. It's just not the problem that it was. Um, and I think um, they, they've gotten smarter. And so we have to get smarter too about how to address that. And I think um, Global Fishing Watch and other organizations that put together um, big, the, the, the tracking systems of fisheries around the world are an important tool for that. Um, Cassandra, I know you did a lot of work on the toothfish. Um, you know, what about, um, what do you, I mean, what did you see? Did you see that that really, once they, the regulation started, it really got better? Yeah, I mean, Andrea's spot on with, with all that she said. I mean, I think one of the things that Camlar is most well known for is their ability to, to take those crazy illegal fishing operations that were happening and help really stop them. And so it's, it's, it still happens, like Andrea said, but it's really infrequent. And there's just, there's a lot of things in place within Camlar that, um, that end up leading to high compliance, including like they have IEU black uh, vessel lists. And I think that that's a cool thing. Um, I was asked to evaluate recently part of the Rossi MPA and, you know, where are we at with, um, with sort of compliance, you know, are our fishers obeying the boundaries of it and fishing only where they're supposed to be. And so far they are. And that's amazing because we're talking about a massive area, more than 2 million kilometers squared. Um, and the, the fishing industry is following the rules. They're fishing outside of the MPA, the limited places in the MPA where they're allowed to fish. Um, they're doing that too. And I guess to that point, you know, if we are, if, if Camlar is going to continue to have fishing in the Southern Ocean, then I do think to the finance question, I think there's an important opportunity actually to work within the fishing industry to help with the research and monitoring and enforcement. And there are some sub-Antarctic fisheries that do just this. They actually will report if they see illegal operations happening um, and they help with some of the research and monitoring. It is really expensive to, to do this uh, research and monitoring and enforcement. And so I think there is a real opportunity for collaboration there. If they're gonna be there, let's, <laughs> let's work with them. And, and I think fishers, um, 
many fishers want to keep fishing for a long time, right? If they are, if they are going to be on the water and, and they, they are, some of them are thinking about the next generation and keeping that going. And so, um, so yeah, like a lot in, within Kemlar, uh, the fishing industry, a lot of them supported the MPA coming into play. So, cause they see the value of it. That's amazing. Um, all right. And last question is going to Jose Maria. Jose Maria, um, you have like a minute. So remember that you've got like a minute. Um, uh, Antarctica is geopolitical sensitive area. Some people think that the geopolitical sensitivity is also a tricky point of the establishment of NPAs. So can Kamlar members work beyond the geopolitical sensitivities and establish NPAs? And how could they do that? They can, they have proved it, and they can do it again. Antarctica is preserved by humanity, by the treaty and by Kamlar, for science and peace. Let science take the day and peace reign. Move forward with the three MPAs, four million square kilometers in 2020. Incredible. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of our panelists, Jose Maria, to Peter, to Andrea, to Stephanie and Cassandra. Thank you all that have joined us today. Uh, as we said in the panel, remember you all have influence, not just on politicians, but on voters and on friends and family. So go out there, spread the word of our amazing Antarctica so we can get it protected for all of humanity. Um, thank you all so much. It was a great discussion. Stay safe, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you, Ashland. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you all.